Hello. So welcome to Change Agents, the impact of social justice docs. Thrilled to have here with me, beginning on my right, Talia Tibbin. She and Joshua Bennett are directors and producers of the film Sky and Ground. They are Jonathan Daniel Award winners. So you will see that film this evening, and I'll be talking with them at greater length tonight. And then to their right, I guess, Joey Carey, who is producer of The Organizer. The film is directed by Nick Taylor, but Joey is here with us today. And then representing on the New Hampshire front, we have Carlina Lyons. She is the writer and Michael Venn, director of The Heroin Effect. So they all have more detailed bios in the program, but we'd love to get to the conversation, so we're going to move on from right there. Um, so just I wanted to begin Obviously, doing a social justice documentary or any kind of documentary takes such a commitment and so much passion. So wondering how you narrowed down on topics. And I wanted to start with you, Talia, because you have a really interesting story about how you found the family that you found. Maybe we can do it um, together. And Josh can start talking about the project, mm -hmm. the big, big picture project, and I can take it. Sure, sure thing. Sure. Because the, the, we do want to get to this idea of programming and how that accompanies so many documentaries, the, the kind of how you get it out there in the community, maybe working with schools, maybe coming up with lesson plans or other sort of community engagement plans. Um, so we will definitely get to that, the big project, big picture, picture project. Sure. Uh, well, I think this came out of, uh, I work with a company in New York called Show of Force, and we had done projects on uh, women's empowerment, uh, gender violence. Uh, they were titled uh, Half the Sky uh, and A Path Appears, based on the books by Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Boudin. And uh, those books were really part of a number of projects that really kind of sparked talking about um, the injustices, the myriad injustices that women face around the world, and kind of moving the dial to have a more evolved conversation about that. And uh, we were looking around at um, you know, what was happening with the refugee crisis and also what was happening with conflict in the world and seeing that you know, 2015 to 2016 uh, was the year of the most, uh, the highest number of conflicts in recorded history around the world. Uh, and with that, the uh, largest displacement in the world. Uh, and so we thought that was a really uh, compelling place to look at how could we zero in and tell human stories around refugees and migrations and share uh, stories that hopefully would get people to think about this in a very uh, empathetic way as opposed to just thinking about numbers and statistics. And we uh, heard Itamini, Greece was a um, you know, place where thousands of refugees were amassing on the border. This was in 2016, right when borders across Europe were starting to shut down and countries were shifting in their policies towards not allowing refugees to come in. And uh, Talia traveled to Itamini and uh, can take it from there. Yeah, I, I want to say that um, I was in the office when the, the whole project was rolling and I, I was working on something completely different. But there was a team that was working on humanity on the move and I just could not stop myself from like, hey, um, oh, I know someone who can, oh, I heard a story that I just like, kept butting in. And because I think just as a, as a citizen, uh, watching those images over the course of the summer, um, before, before um, in the summer of 16, I guess, 15 or 16, 15, um, um, and the, the tsunami of people just walking through Europe, I, I just wanted to somehow be involved. And I was, I didn't know how. So this was the, great, the, the best opportunity. And when, when uh, the suggestion came that I will go to Idomeni and see what's going on, I thought, this is great. I just drop everything else um, and turn up. I, I'm Jewish. And for me to, to see those images um, just immediately threw me back to what generations of you know, my family, other families, have experienced 70 years ago. It was just something to connect to. And the fact that, you know, History is repeating itself. Half of the world just wants to look away um, was something that I, I really connected to. So um, going to Idomeni and then finding one story out of the, the about 10,000 people there when I got yeah. there, um, every one of them was a great story. I mean, we stumbled on tents that had, you know, as soon as you sort of lifted the curtain, you, you met a crazy story. Uh, we, we stood in, in line and, and, and wait, waiting for lunch and you heard incredible, incredible stuff. But this particular family, and I'll, I'll just skip some of that, we had some Facebook interaction with them before. Uh, there was a scout that had a quick interview with Guevara, and he, you know, 
he definitely knew what we were trying to do. So when I first met with him, I knew he would be on board. Mm -hmm. And then it was a matter of, you know, convincing the family that we're just there to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And um, we're trying to do that very much through their eyes, which is, I think, the most important part of, of this film, which is, it's our film, it's Show of Force's film, but it's very much the, the family's film. Yeah. And they were about to leave, I think, the next day, they weren't were, they thinking, they, planning? They were, the idea they was the borders were closing quickly, and they were about to leave. The borders were already closed. Mm -hmm. They were just at a point where they're like, enough. We, um, they, they used to have this very, very democratic family, and they had big family meetings. So even the nine-year-old gets to opinionate about what we do next. And um, they just decided they're going to leave their neighbors, which is the next tent, um, felt the same way. So the younger generation of the 20 to 26 year olds were tasked with sort of figuring out how to do it. Um, there's a big network in the refugee camps of which, which road to take, what time is the patrol, uh, how to find a cell phone with the right SIM card and, and so on. And they immediately got on top of that. And they were trying to leave actually the day we got there mm, until it turns out that um, the pin for their data didn't work, so they had to delay it by a day, but the next day they were off and we were with them. Yeah, right on time. And I know for you, Michael, it was kind of a, a personal thing. It Wasn't it a run-in with an old friend that kind of got you rolling on this? Yeah. I, uh, Tell us. You utilize the microphone a little bit here. No, I, uh, it, was, it was a super, you know, it was in the news every day, the heroin problem, the opiate epidemic going on in the country, and I literally you know, was walking home with my dog and my son from grabbing a cup of coffee and ran into a friend of mine I hadn't seen in a long time and uh, I knew he had been in a bad car accident and he looked like he was doing pretty well and I was like, hey, you know, you look like you're doing good, haven't you seen in a while? And he goes, you know, the real story. And I was like, no, and I'm friends with his family and stuff like that. And he goes, yeah, uh, I'm a heroin addict. I uh, totaled my car on, you know, a major highway, lucky to be alive. I've been in recovery for 11 months, um, living in a treatment, uh, uh, a sober living facility, and uh, and I just looked at him, going, you know, this is a guy who, if you looked at on the outside, you know, as far as perceptions go, good-looking guy, well-educated, you know, was getting a master's degree at the time, um, you know, good-looking, looked like he stepped off the cover of GQ, like always. So, you know, it, my sh perception just shifted because, you know, I looked at him and I was like, wow, this is somebody my son could grow up to be like, or, um, you know, you want your daughter to date kind of thing. Like, he's that guy. And when you hear that that's who he was and it shifts your your kind of perception of, okay, who who is this affecting, re you know, really? And uh, it kind of just went from there and, you know, one thing led to another. And, and so I had that interaction, went home, wrote down in a notebook an idea about, hey, I want to do a film on heroin without shoot, you know, people um, shooting up or scoring dope or, or following a homeless person around, but you know, tell a kind of real story mm -hmm. of recovery. And, uh, and that was kind of, kind of where it started. And then just being introduced to a whole bunch of people and following some really interesting stories. Yeah, I want to ask you more about that because we have seen a lot of you know, the heroin stories that are you know, inside of a dingy looking room, people shooting up, watch, and that experience is obviously very powerful, but was that a real decision on your part as filmmakers to not do that? Why? Yeah, I, that story's been told. I mean, that was for me, I was like, I, I wanted to see a movie I hadn't seen before and I didn't want to see a movie that's, you know, that same story over and over and over again. And uh, especially when you get to know a few people and you're like, yeah, no, this was my version of that. Um, you know, and as somebody who, you know, grew up listening to music and being influenced by music and looking at things and going, realizing that just about every musical artist that ever influenced me growing up, somebody in that band was a heroin addict, mm. whether it was, you know, you know, Miles Davis or John Coltrane, or, you know, you can go down the list and you start naming bands like Sublime or Jane's Addiction and you just, oh. Nine Inch Nails, like I start going and you can't stop. And that for me was one of those things where I was like, okay, every band that I was ever interested in as a kid um, that influenced me creatively as a musician, yeah, there was somebody affected by heroin in that band. I was like, well, what's you know, what's that kind of commonality, and where did it go from? So, Carlina, I'll just add, and it wasn't even. It was definitely a decision up front, but it was something we kept talking about and reminding ourselves throughout the process because the the, the nature of film is to titillate. So some of the time you have to check yourself. Mm. You know, where we would come across some footage, of, wow, this is amazing stuff, but no, it's it's going against our 
precedent that we've set. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a challenge because titillating things are titillating for a reason. Mm. You know? Yeah, Joey, I want to ask you a little bit about that because um, the film, the organizer, you know, follows this guy, unbelievably charismatic character, you know, uh, uh, the right would call him a radical for all the reasons that they hate, and the left would call him a radical for all the reasons that they love. But you are following somebody who a filmmaker could easily fall in love with, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you how did you work through kind of pulling back from that? Because it's it's a critical look at his leadership style as well. Yeah, I would say we spend a lot of time filming with him, just on the ground, following him around, doing what. He does, he goes all over the place, talking about organizing, putting, doing training sessions, meeting with groups all over the world, and we followed him. And when we couldn't travel internationally all the time, we'd send a local crew. And so it became a very normalized uh, relationship to have a camera rolling all these different times where he's doing his work. So we tried to keep it grounded like that because the story itself is so politicized and when you start to look at news events that have go- gone on around ACORN, it's very dramatic, and it's all about you know, the right wing's uh, you know line would be they're destroying democracy, and it's sort of this big propaganda piece. So we wanted to avoid that as much as possible. I think we include some 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 uh, representations of that through news media and archival stuff that we pulled out. But you know, when filming with Wade, he's charismatic enough. We don't need to create anything. Mm-hmm. He does it himself. But it was interesting to me learning a little bit um, about him and, and the development of ACORN, you know, uh, public service announcements during the 1970s, 80s with, you know, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. So those are the kind of like, you put that in there, you make a decision to put that in there for a reason, because it, it gives a sort of credibility and it shows different things. But I'm curious about that idea about when do you feel like this is titillating. Or- well, we, and we had a lot of discussions about that. You know, there's, old, there's an old clip in a uh, slideshow where Acorn hired Morgan Freeman before he was known as anybody to do the voiceover. Before he was God. That they wrote. Yeah. And we found this in the archives when we were doing research. The Wisconsin Historical Society holds all these archives. And we found this and we talked with one of the guys who was the, the main photographer for that slideshow and they gave us a tape and there's music in the background and we had to figure out how to edit it because we weren't going to have a five minute Morgan Freeman interlude in the film. <laughs> but um, then we found all these radio spots mm-hmm. with Rob Reiner and Jack uh, Nicholson and you know people who everybody's heard of who back then were helping support some of the work that Acorn was doing as, as promotion. Um, we, we had a lot of discussions at different version, trying to cut down the film to see if we were sort of falling into this trap of just using it because they're well-known names. And mm. We kept it. They're short pieces. I think it adds a little something fun to it and shows that, you know, Acorn's been doing this work and has had people supporting them in those, you know, high profile uh, roles for yeah. a while. Yeah. I want to ask you about that, too, because I know you, you are following this story I'm sorry, following this family, and I don't know if people got it, but Guevara is the name of the main character. He's sort of nicknamed for Che Guevara, actually, um, in this family from Syria. Um, So deeply involved in their lives, going along with them. You said something earlier about trying to, you know, you had to find someone whose whole family would go along with this. How did that feel for you? At some points, you could have been endangering them with your crew and your camera and your lights, right? So, that, I mean, that was a decision that I made um, very early on, and, and as things came came along, we, we talked about this, and um, we knew we're not going to break the law. So even if they are crossing a, a border knowingly, because sometimes you can't even tell where the border is, but if they're crossing a border illegally, we're going to meet them on the other side. Mm. We are not going to break the law. Um, also, I didn't want to, and this is a decision, and I think sometimes Filmmakers are, you know, some of them are activists, and I think a female, uh, a filmmaker activist would have made a different decision. But I made a point of not being embedded to, with them to the point that I would alter their journey or put them in danger. So um, I was not embedded with them that I became, I, I did the, the same, fully the same experience mm-hmm. as they had. Uh, it brought up a whole other set of, of challenges, um, but. 
yeah, sometimes we had to decide, and, and they were quite aware also of, of the fact that having the camera, having a light on in the middle of the night when they're trying to sneak through a highway uh, was putting them in danger. And half of the family would sometimes go like, do not tell them where we are. So, so Guevara would be like, I'll just send you the location, and then it'll be like total silence. And 30 minutes later, I'll be like, what's going on? Oh, the family is not so comfortable if you show up. So we would arrange for all these meeting points where you know, we, we both agreed that we're not putting them in danger. But it was a decision minute after minute. I mean, every negotiation time all the time, it sounds like, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I have to say, not the whole family was on board with this the whole mm -hmm. time. They were also traveling as, as a bigger group. There were two families um, in both, on both journeys. I don't want to do a spoiler alert. But um, it was the, another family that you had to, it had less of a stake in this, in this mm -hmm. film that you had to convince. And you had, what are these people from America, mostly, doing here with a camera? And why do we have to, and this is another part of this, let them into our lives. And, and I think it's probably speaking to what you've been through in some of the most vulnerable yeah. and, and not necessarily dignified moments. Um, so it was really a negotiation every day, every hour that we filmed with them. Um, and sometimes we had to sort of respect if there was a majority against us. Mm -hmm. and we just had to turn off the camera and just sit there like that. Yeah, that is a question for Michael and Carlina. You know, these are addicts talking about their experience. Sometimes things that are just, you, you, clearly they're ashamed of them. And did anybody say, please, no, you know, I, I said too much? There, are, uh, there, were, there were people that didn't make the final cut of the film who were really happy they didn't. Yeah. That, you know, actually had called me and said, hey, I'm doing a lot better now. Um, is there any chance you can maybe kind of cut me out of that? And I was like, you know what? We had already made a decision and, and we pared it down to the core of the people that are in it. And so we were, which they were very happy about. Mm -hmm. And then some people were very grateful of being able to share their story and help others. And, um, you know, we were fortunate in that we got to show, um, you know, Daniel's cell phone footage, you know, that he shot of himself while he was using. Yeah. And, um, and some other stuff that like really gave you a different look into somebody's mindset of, you know. Addiction. Yeah, so this was, Carlina, go, no, oh. sorry. Oh, I was just gonna add that, um, uh, and, and even despite, because you know, there's always the legal rights versus the yeah. ethical rights. And even though, you know, in the very beginning we got sign off from everybody beyond who we needed. Um, at the same time, we still sat down and said, it doesn't matter. If they come to me and say, I don't want my story told now, done hmm. you know and, and that's that was something i, I felt very oh, yeah, we, we both felt very we passionate moment, about where we were like, like where it was almost this no, this could all end because we end. will end we might end yeah. up just going you, you know what this film doesn't or, or this isn't going to work now because this very key portion of this film if they say no we're going to say well there goes our film right and I'm, I'm guessing that now everywhere you guys go people talk to you about you know someone they know with an addiction problem or what's going on i'm sure that's happening right yes it's been, it's been um Personally, it's been very interesting for me because I did lose a family member to, to heroin a dozen years ago when it was a very, very different climate. Mm -hmm. And when I would mention it then, the room would quiet, people would get uncomfortable. And now it's, it's almost warped humorousness, the way that the people react. Oh, yeah, me too. You know, oh, yeah, I lost it. it it's, a, it's a disturbing kinship yeah. that we seem to share now that we didn't share 12 years ago. Right. But I wonder about, uh, Talia brought up this idea of the difference between the activist and the filmmaker, and I'm sure for all of you that must have come up, and I'm especially interested to talk with you about that, Josh, because you actually worked, you know, you, you work for an organization that is, that is highlighting a real problem in the world right now, and this, this is something that could be an activist position. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think uh, doing these projects always forces you to really think about your own beliefs and what you really care about. Um, what are your priorities? Why are you telling this story? Because as Talia said, even if we're not intervening and trying to alter events, you're dedicating a lot of your life and a lot of your time to really telling this story and putting this story out there in a way that hopefully people will see it. And I think that um, it's, it's always a challenge to kind of separate your personal feelings and your values from what you're making. And in a lot of ways, those values, I think, drive what the project becomes. So I think 
In our case, there's a commitment to the craft of documentary storytelling and journalism and telling stories that are balanced and that are fair and that really present authentic narratives. But I think there's also a desire to reach people in a way that opens up conversations, maybe changes hearts and minds and perspective. Because mm -hmm. I think also um, you have to be true to your beliefs and you, know, you have to care about the things that you care about, especially in today's world. I think we can't really say in anything we do that there's an, an objectivity. Everything is subjective. And I think your point of view is always subjective. And so I think it's staying true to the principles and the values that you build your work on that then would allow you to have that work to then share a larger message and then present the work and then discuss the message. So discuss what could be breakthroughs and how we think about refugees or how we think about drug addicts or how we think about inequality. I think these films offer that opportunity. I think now more than ever, powerful documentary films, powerful stories open up these doors to conversations that are unfortunately not taking place in the places that maybe they should be mm -hmm. right now in this current political climate? That's a really good question because I'm guessing that the people who show up at film festivals to see a social justice documentary probably already think a lot like the documentary filmmaker who's making them. I mean, is that, I think it's a fair assumption. So uh, uh, I guess, where do we go with that? The sort of idea of like, how do you, how do you draw an audience outside of that? And is documentary film about convincing somebody of something different? So I, I, I wanted to add actually to what Josh said, and, and I think, yes, all filmmaking is subjective, and all documentaries are, to a great extent, personal. Um, and, and I think that, you know, when I started this, there were calls from the office, I don't remember, uh, where people said, oh, you should talk to the other side. You should interview the minister of this and go to the Greek parliament and find someone from the Macedonian police. And, and it just didn't feel right, because, as if this was a news story, it was another mm -hmm. another case, mm -hmm. and then you you your position is to present the story, both sides, let the people decide. In this case, we didn't necessarily try to convince anyone, but we felt that this was a voice and a and a story that wasn't heard, and it just did not feel right to add those extra voices to the story. We wanted these people to be able to tell, after all these news reports, all these images, to tell their own stories um, without, you know, we are just a vehicle in a way, rather than a facilitator, rather than sort of telling their story. Um, it, that, that was how I felt about that. And there was, we made a choice not to bring those outside voices, mm -hmm. not to have the sort of other side as saying that this is not necessarily the case or, you know, and, and in terms of convincing, I think that the point of this documentary is just the humanity of it. Um, so, it, and again, it's hard, <laughs> people haven't seen it. Um, it's just, you see this family and they're so much like so many other families and possibly like yours. They're bickering, they're jokes, they're, you know, they just found themselves in, in this very unfortunate situation, which they're desperately trying to change. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It's about the humanity of the situation rather than trying to get people to be pro this or against that or politically involved, it's just to understand the, human the humanitarian crisis that this is. Joey, I would think that for you, the, the, the pressure was on a little bit more to show like the other side. Do you feel that way? Well, I, not, not so much. I think that the other side is out there already on all the news channels and it was covered <laughs> from a perspective. And we're, we were trying to tell a specific story that is very centered around the founder, around Wade, his story, the work he continues to do, uh, while also talking about the history of, of the organization that he built, mm -hmm. along with other people. But do you that. feel like there is, I mean, would you, and have you, I wonder, in reviews of the film, have you been accused of activism? Uh, I wouldn't say accused of activism, but I think people definitely would say there's a specific perspective on it, and there's an aspect of propaganda <laughs> People would say it's a propaganda piece. I, I would argue that it's not. But there, there's, there's the need to have multiple perspectives in the world, and there already exists one that's out there. And so sometimes it falls on in a film to provide another perspective. Um, you know, I, I don't. I, I set out much more to make this project. Uh, because I want to use it as an organizing tool. I think it's educational, I think it's motivating, it engages people, and we want more people involved in the political process. Uh, 
there's also the approach that it's a personal story and it's not about using it as for anything other than sharing an experience with people and talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a balance, I guess. Right. Um, we did reach out quite a bit to people on the other side of the political spectrum. Most people didn't want to be a part of the film. And even within ACORN, there's different factions and there's, there's tension there between some of the original organizers from the 70s and Wade, and a lot of those people wouldn't be in our film. Mm. So it, it, we were working with what, what we could get people to do. Right. Yeah. Carlina, you... <clears throat> oh, I would just add that I think it's... It's important to clarify that being an activist filmmaker doesn't make it a bad thing. I think there are, there, there are a billion approach, approaches to filmmaking, a documentary film. Every, yeah, big eyes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think that the important thing is when, as long as the filmmaker is audience, honest with themselves and with the audience about what they're trying to present, that that then it's fine. Mm. You know, this is my opinion, no problem. This was my personal experience, no problem. I'm trying to convince you of something. No problem, as long as you are forthright in your intention. I think then, you know, there's, there's room for all of these different kinds of films. Well, you are also, uh, you and you especially, I mean, to a degree, of course, social justice and voting rights are still a problem, but you, uh, the heroin effect and Earth and Sky are both very much um, about current policy. You know, current policy debates. So you, how did you feel about wading into that or approaching that? Or did you think, I don't want to be dated? I mean, I'm just wondering what the conversations were about that. Oh, I'll defer to Mike on most of that. But I just want to say as long as if it starts a conversation, great. Like we've had a couple screenings where people end up in fights. Great. You know, <laughs> I, I love or, or don't like what they've done. Great. It's made you think about it. It's made you talk about it. Yeah. Success. Yeah. I was going to say for... I, I totally agree. I wouldn't say fights, like yeah. not fist fights. Not fist but, fights. No, uh, a couple of screenings where, like, I had somebody come up to me afterwards, you know, uh, like an hour after, and he sat down and argued with me about my film, mm. and I was like, and I'm like, you totally don't. What he was saying to me meant so much, and I looked at him. I said, thank you, and he's like, what do you mean? He's like, I, I disagree with everything in your film. I know. I'm like, but we're talking mm -hmm. about it, and I change your perception right. of people who are or heroin addicts or addicted to opiates and stuff like that. And he looked at me kind of funny, and I was like, no, I appreciate everything that you yeah. just said because you just had a moment where you felt the need to single me out in a crowded room of people, sit down with me, like interrupt, like mm -hmm. like dinner with my girlfriend kind of thing. Not really, you know. It was, <laughs> But and sit down and hung out and we had this really like back and forth you know conversation about addiction about heroin addiction about and and he was looking at it from his perspective prior to and, and really like why should we help addicts and they got themselves in the situation mm -hmm. and, and it was a it was a great conversation because it it really helped shift his perspective and his perception of things and I could see him being challenged with his thoughts so it was a wonderful. It was, it, it, was, it was great. Like, I just sat there with a grin on my face. And, and at first, I think he thought I was, like, like mocking him. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, legitimately, I love the fact that you are you're challenging me. You and I are having a real conversation. And I think in society these days, you know, people would rather text. They don't want to talk on a phone. You know what I mean? Like, we sat there, two guys, talking very seriously about a film. And it was wonderful because I ran into, you know, he happened to live in the same town as I do or work in the same town. And I ran into him a week later getting coffee. And he looked at me and he goes, I still need to talk to you some more about your film. And I was like, I, you have my email. Like, let's get together. And uh, it was wonderful. So that's, that, that sounds that. to me like the thing that you would most want. I loved it. But is there a real conversation there? How about for you guys? I mean, because this is, I mean, this is another thing about your film. Super hot topic in 2015, 16. You know, everyone saw the picture of the little kid mm. who turned up, you know, on the shore. I mean, just an unbelievably gripping photograph. And that was a thing. And then the news cycle moves on. And then we're all about, you know, keeping refugees out. I mean, the news switches. So you are talking about an issue that is currently, in the U.S. at least, not as top of mind. So. Yeah, I think, I mean, to, to what, what stands as the best testimony to that is that the U.S. has so far this year allowed 11 Syrians in. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. um, Not that I have any opinion on that. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, I, I think that, again, going back to the, the goal of this film, this is a crisis that has been so politicized, and we're seeing the, 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 the U.S. side of it in, in bringing people here from other countries, people who turn up here as refugees of 
different kind of violence. There is no war, you know, a inter-country war or or uh, what would happen with the Arab Spring, um, and it's being used there. The image of refugee is being so politicized and being used against them. And I think what this film is trying to do is just show you that there are no one chooses to to be in that position. And there are 26 million people now in the world, something like that, who are in, internationally displaced. Um, so the fact that the news cycle has moved on doesn't mean that the crisis mm -hmm. has ended. The fact that in the U.S. there's less attention to that and or sort of an, an attempt to completely um, shut the door, it doesn't mean that it's it's over. And, and if we're seeing what's going on in specifically Syria right now, it's just getting worse. So there will be more people trying to, people who thought they can still hold on to whatever they had there, they'll probably try to get out of there. I don't know if they'll try necessarily to come here, but they'll try to, to find their way out of there. Mm -hmm. half, half of Syrians are displaced by now. Well, you all will see the film tonight, but it is one of those, I mean, I spoke to these guys earlier and told them that you know it made me want to quit my job and move, you know, to work with refugees. And there's a kind of fired upness that happens after a lot of um, social justice docs, if we're creating that kind of umbrella for them. So where do you go from fired up, I guess, is the question. Um, I think that uh, you know, well, you, you want to get the film out to as many, um, you know, people as you can. And, uh, you know, we'll be broadcasting with uh, World Channel on PBS in September, uh, mm -hmm. September 9th and 16th for our film specifically. But I also think we're in a moment right now where uh, it's very easy to kind of live in our own bubbles. People talk about social media bubbles or we talk about, you know, Netflix and chill and staying at home and just watching whatever's on the TV and streaming. I think right now is a time that demands people going out, building communities just like the idea, uh, you know, refugees in our film, that was a political term that was made after World War II to say the world would say never again. We're going to guarantee these rights to people because that's what we as a world community believe in. That's what we as Western democracies believe in is that people fleeing conflict should have safe haven somewhere. They should have the opportunity to live a life that's stable, where they can follow their hopes and their dreams and have certain protections. Right now, we're in a place where that's all up in the air. And uh, it's, it's a profoundly difficult question, but it's also a profoundly important question in terms of who we are as people. Who are we as a Western democracy? Who are we as the greatest country in the world? These questions are more relevant than ever now, and they require people coming together to talk about that. So I think for us, we've done this in the past on our other projects. This is part of an umbrella a project called Humanity on the Move, where we'll be going to communities, we'll be going to college campuses, we'll be starting screening groups. Right now, the same way a film like The Organizer or The Heroin Effect is about people coming together to talk about this. It's about reaching out, it's about building communities, it's about staying in touch with each other right now, because that's where these battle lines are being drawn between people coming together, people standing up for what they're believing in. It's not going to happen just by posting on Facebook or staying home and binge watching television. It's going to happen getting people together, building community, standing together, and speaking for what you believe in. And so I hope the film is a catalyst for that. And that's really what I think these films are all about, an opportunity for people to come together like this, to talk about these issues, make connections, make bonds, and then do something together. Mm, well, it's difficult enough to get a film made. It, it sounds like, to me, programming and the, everything that goes around the screenings, where they're placed, that kind of strategy, is that, is that an essential part of making a documentary film now? I'm looking at you, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you're from the... From day one, I think you're thinking about where it's going to go and who's going to see it and how are you going to reach them. And, you know, I mean, we started this film eight years ago and the landscape of how people are consuming content has changed quite a bit in the last eight years. So we've tried to adapt our, you know, approach to it. And we're still figuring out where it's going to be, how it's going to get out there, what distributors we're going to work with. But we're doing a lot of what you were just talking about, which is engagement on the local level. We're working uh, on building a nationwide screening campaign collaborating with national groups that already exist, um, such as, you know, we're talking with them, it's not established yet, Indivisible, Move On, you know, Citizen Action, 
you know, those type of groups that already do local work and local organizing everywhere. And we want to use this film as an organizing tool where you host a screening in a community, you invite the people out there who are maybe part of them are already members of the local group and people who you want to sign up so that you motivate people, you educate people, and then at the end you engage them and you get people to sign up and become a part of what uh, groups, of whatever group is doing work that's important to them in their community. That can also, our, our idea and goal is to uh, not only engage people with local groups across the country, but to increase voter turnout in the fall and that this whole campaign will lead to a wider release in September and October on a platform such as Netflix or whatever ahead of the midterms mm -hmm. so that people then turn out. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so, Forget exactly what you asked, well, but it's, uh, is this is this an essential part of making a documentary film now that you create a kind of programming arm around it and obviously a strategy for getting it out in communities? I mean, I, I, I would say just to close that idea, it's like if you don't premiere your film at Sundance or Berlin or South by Southwest or Toronto or Tribeca, yeah, you 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 most likely have to do your own or do some capacity distribute your film yourself. Mm -hmm. How much of how much of your job on this film was that? Well, we haven't distributed it yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you know anybody. <laughs> Carlina. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize your point about community and connection with, with groups because one of, the, one of my biggest things that I learned in uh, making documentaries before this is the, the importance of those connections. There are a lot of great organizations out there already. The world doesn't need another New Hampshire opioid organization. And I, I think it's it was really important for me to learn the lesson of connecting with people who have a need that I can fill rather than trying to take on these tasks myself. I'm the filmmaker. I'm I'm not the expert, you know, to know my place. I am providing this media content and to work with great people who want your content and you are fill, fulfilling each other's needs. I think those are the best relationships that I've had the pleasure of being in. I want to make sure we get some time for audience questions. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Hi. Have you ever, any of you, felt that when you're being approached by or soliciting a festival, that you'd like to put the Q&A contribution to focus on networking locally rather than on the film? Because now you have fired up the community, but you're not harnessing that energy. And it seems to me you can facilitate and encourage on-the-ground work which has got to be somewhere in your vision. Or at least seeing that kind of outcome has got to be something you care about. So it seems to me the festival idea needs to pivot. There's a couple things that I think about that, which is festivals often are scheduled back to back to back, and it's 10 to 15 minutes for a QA. and a And like you were just saying, it's not necessarily us or the festival who has that reach in the community where the film is playing. Mm -hmm. So unless we're able to partner with a local group who's going to engage people and translate that motivation that people have at the end of the screening into continued action and organization and, and a campaign that they're running, that without that, it's very hard to do. So we've talked about doing this a lot with different festivals. We have some different... Uh, degrees of being able to do that successfully, but it, it, we're not really there yet. We, have, we haven't been able to find that model that is replicable, that will work, whether it's a festival or a university or a community group hosting a screening. Would you, I'm curious if the panel would find, you know, now versus maybe 10 to 12 years ago, I feel like there's more of a hunger for the kind of content we create now for the cause. I think that the power of story is, is being recognized more and more maybe over the past decade. And whereas before it was seen as a fluff piece of a project, it is now seen as an integral part to do. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I totally take your point. Uh, I wish there would be more times in our screenings where we could really interact with the community. And I think some festivals, every festival is different. Some have more of an opportunity for that. Others are more totally industry facing. What I meant is but when you contract, can you say that this would be your concern that you would like to see without people brushing off to the rest of the festival or without people being just individuals when they've shared this mm -hmm. space? I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that depending on where your film is in a festival, you can kind of make more demands. I think a lot of times as filmmakers, you're, you're really getting into the festival and then mm -hmm. figuring things out from there. But, you know, even in those moments, we've 
connected with legal groups in Durham. We were at the Full Frame Festival and we met through uh, Duke, uh, a number of community groups that are hosting refugees. We're gonna be doing screenings with them. We're gonna be doing advocacy work with them. So even in those 15 minute moments, there's opportunities to like make connections and then get people moving on the ground. We were doing it in California. We've been doing it in uh, Oregon. So for us, we take that seriously. And I think after every Q&A as filmmakers, we're not just looking to talk to uh, you know the person from Amazon or whatever. Right. You know we're there to to meet with people who are doing good work in the communities. That's I think important to Tally and myself. And I think everybody on this panel like well, you know you can't separate that from right. the work. And this comes through in the community screenings. I think that we're all doing especially. We had a great screening this morning with a, a lovely conversation after. And something I think and I've seen this in other screenings and something Michael and I feel is important, we love to have an expert in, in opioid addiction with us on the Q&A huh. because we tend to get so many questions. You know, we all become a little bit mini experts in the thing you make yeah. a film on, but you're still the filmmaker, you're not the, yeah. the expert. And I, I, I personally really value, and I know because that's too, when we have like someone like Natalie this morning mm -hmm. who is an expert in her field to to handle those questions. I want to pick up on your point, though, Carlene, you were talking about the, the, the greater thirst for these kind of stories in the last 10 years. But this in this intervening 10 years, people are watching a lot more content from their phones or at home. I mean, getting people out into a participatory uh, civic space, if I can use that term, is that more difficult? And, you know, who goes to film festivals? It's, it's kind of the usual suspects. Yeah, exactly. Except for... Film festivals often um, these days get used as a catalyst to bring content to wider media. So mm -hmm. there will be, and Netflix and Amazon and Apple, they are watching what's being watched in film festivals. So, I, and I, I come from a background where a lot of my documentaries are on TV. Um, and, you know, there will be 200 people in the room or 500 people in the room for a film festival, but you know, another film that I made just ran two weeks ago and it was half a million people watched it that night. Um, I think that there's still power in, in, in those festivals and in the ability to reach influencers, if you like, mm -hmm. people who can bring it further. I think that there's a lot of criticism now of, of, of the Netflixing of a lot of this industry, but um, Netflix and Amazon have taken on very, you know, projects that are full of subtitles, which was unheard of, mm. you know, five years ago. Um, issues like heroin that were difficult to watch for people, shorts that were uh, harder to find homes for. You can find them now on those platforms. Mm. So you may have to search and have them edited to your algorithm somehow, but the, 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 the festivals are helping in some way to get to those wider platforms. Any other questions here from the audience? I, I'm curious what you're all working on as your next project. Could we hear from all of you? I can't quite tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has to do, it has to do actually, I'll just say it has to do with um, a different kind of refugee crisis that is affecting the US right now. Mm. Um, I'm working on a few different projects, um, but uh, you know, one project in particular is uh, talking about inequality in America and uh, the real story of how many millions of people are falling through the cracks in America. So we're just getting started on that, and it's very exciting because it's kind of taking an honest look at a lot of the untold stories of injustice and inequality um, here in this country. Joshua, tell us again the website for, is it Humanity on the Move? Yeah, so humanityonthemove.org is where you can find this film. We also did a couple of films on uh, Central American migration and uh, what's happening in El Salvador uh, and Guatemala and Mexico uh, for, you know, kind of the U.S. border policies. But, uh, you know, Sky and Ground is, uh, you know, one that we're going to be taking out to a number of places. We'll be screening at a few other festivals. We'll also be uh, broadcasting with PBS in September. So I encourage you guys to check out the website and find out more information. We'll also be updating it with resources where you can find uh, ways to get involved in groups supporting migration and refugees and having conversations about this issue that aren't really happening right now, I think, in some of the mainstream media outlets. Mm -hmm. How about you, Joey? Getting, besides getting a distribution deal. <laughs> uh, starting a new documentary about a a uh, very well-known tattoo artist named Mark Mahoney, who was one of the founders of the black and gray tattoo movement. So it will chart some of the uh, changes from the 70s until now and the 
discuss themes such as commercialization and mainstreamization of tattoos. Wow. That How sounds about, fun. Yeah. That's a little fun. different than this one. I like it. Uh, let's see. So I have a, a, three things. I am producing Lena Barakat's film, Light Attaching to a Girl. So she's in post on that, and that's very fun. Uh, I'm working on another documentary with a Bob Nesson of Nesson Media out of Boston about um, uh, a couple of gentlemen who were sentenced to life without parole at age 18 and just the, the ridiculousness of, of sentencing someone for life at, when they're a child. And then uh, hopefully I'll be going with a, an NGO based out of Boston to uh, an area in Southern Africa to film testimonials from girls who have been involved in a, um, a supportive nurturing program and just testimonials of how they've uh, experienced that and their successes and failures, et cetera, for stakeholders. Wow. How about you, Michael? I, I love the fact that everybody's got a great story here. Um, other than working on distribution, I do. And oh. tell them what you're doing. Uh, with well, I'm going to take a break yeah. from making films for a little while, just because yeah. after, you know, you throw three years and you, you know, and mm -hmm. you go, I need a break for a little while. Like I always joke, I'm like, I need to do like a horror film, <laughs> just because it's so outside anything. Which I'm afraid of horror films. Just, and I just want to yell cut and then laugh because everything <laughs> is so obscenely stupid in horror films. Yet yeah, scary when you watch them. Tell them um, the state recovery thing. Though, oh that's yeah. Interesting well, through the through the film, I met somebody who's in the film, uh, Eric Spofford, who owns Granite Recovery Centers as well as Spofford and uh, con uh, Companies, which is. Um, but through doing some freelance stuff with him, one day he was like, "Hey, I want to do a whole social media thing and start this whole division and really attack that." And he's like, "You interested?" And I was like. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we sat and talked, and so now I'm the social media content creator, the director of social media content creation the for, for and, mm -hmm. and we started doing videos, and all of a sudden they're getting, you know, 40,000 views, you know, and, and escalating to the point where there's this, you know, he was at a uh, Big Brother's Big Sisters event, and people were coming up to him going, oh my God, I love the videos you're putting out every day. I can't wait for them. We keep looking for them. And he's like, great, you know, and so we're growing that portion of it. Where are they? Where can someone find this? Where can somebody find their? Oh, your, on Facebook. In various the different Facebook, places. Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram. It's on all those platforms. But it's it's Granite Recovery Centers. Granite Recovery. And the other thing is, it's also his own personal brand that's expanding mm -hmm. out of that, which is Eric mm -hmm. Spofford. But um, yeah, so it's been kind of funny going. Oh, this is. It's like I'm dealing in some ways doing the same thing I've been doing for the last three years on this film. It's like, hey, I'm going to go, you know, meet up with all these people who are in recovery mm -hmm. now and and talking to them about. Um, their passion for recovery and helping others and doing all that. And uh, it's interesting because in a weird way, it's a corporate workspace. Yeah. But it's unlike any corporate workspace I was ever in. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Like everybody that I work with, it's hysterical, like how much fun people have and like working together. And it's a great community vibe. And the one other thing I want to say is every single person mentioned the word community as they were doing this. Early on, when we didn't have our working title for the film was Community is Greater Than Heroin. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of that, that sentiment that, that community seems to be something that's lost in, uh, in America these days. And, and kind of needing to bring that back, whether it's in a film community, whether it's in um, kind of anything, but just that, that idea of people together, not apart, you know what I mean? Like not uh, binge watching things at home and stuff like that, but actually like going to a theater and seeing a film or something. Yeah. I think there's something about that aspect of community that I think has been lost and hopefully we'll get back, you know? Well, and I'm glad we've got some of that here. Any other additional questions? Just last call, burning desires? Mm -hmm. Quickly, who, who do you most want to see your film? Like you can even name one person if you want. Such a cliche. He'll never, never have the attention span. But um, someone who's been giving such bad name to people from other countries, especially from the Muslim world, like our president, he he would never have the attention span through to sit through eighty six minutes. <laughs> Maybe the trailer. Yeah, I would say uh, you know Donald Trump and Mike Pence. Maybe the Pope could watch it. I think he'd he'd enjoy it. I think the Pope would like it. I don't know Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be almost a little serious and say um, I lost a sister to heroin, so I hope someone who has a sister sees the film and doesn't lose someone. That's my, that's my dream, that someone comes up and says, I'm still here. I didn't lose my sister because of you. Let's go. Well, now I can't see I Yeah, <laughs> you guys have said, uh, you know, Trump, who yeah, I would love to see our film, Barack Obama, who I think would actually watch my film, our film, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I agree with 
you know, that, especially, and I'll, spoiler alert, but when you do a film and people that are in it, you lose them, you know, and they pass away and, and, and you actually go back and shoot stuff based on the fact that somebody passed away who's in your film and you kind of deal with that in a weird way. You go, um, wow, now, you know, now I have to edit my film differently or I have to go reach out and shoot some more footage and, and add it to a film because the story's not complete. Um, I mean, I'd love it if, you know, I don't know, if, if it affected change and however, whoever you could get to watch it. But yeah, Trump doesn't have the uh, attention span for it, but I, God, I would love it. I mean, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> There's no reading involved. involved. Please go and see Sky and Ground tonight. The Jonathan Daniel Award winner. Um, The screening starts at 7.15, so be there early on to, you know, show your stuff on the red carpet and make sure you get a seat. I want to thank Talia and Joshua, Talia Tibben and Joshua Bennett from Sky and Ground. Also, Joey Carey, he's the producer of The Organizer, and Carlina Lyons and Michael Venn. Uh, who are the respective writer and director, producer, producer yeah. director of, of The Heroin Effect. Please ha- join me in thanking them. <laughs> and go see your next movie. <laughs> <laughs>